and bringing it to the young and aspiring academia this establishment has been working with the aim to promote the discourse and discussion about today's india through the lens of scholarly works by many acclaimed authors researchers and scholars such as marcelo musto christopher jaffale upinder singh vijay prasad and tista satalwad to name a few today we have dr taylor c sherman in our midst she is a professor of international history at the london school of economics her research explores the cultural and political history of south asia especially india in the 20th and 21st century today she will be introducing her most recent work titled nehru's india a history in seven myths published by princeton university press this book reassesses the period between 1947 and 1964 by critically evaluating a series of abstracts and words that were strongly associated to india's first prime minister jawaharlal nehru these include terms such as non alignment secularism socialism democracy the state and modernism to name a few i'm sure that the untapped primary sources that have gone into the making of this book will open new vistas of historical research on modern india as a part of her research she stayed here in hyderabad and she can comprehend telugu as well today as the discussant we have dr v rajagopal a professor in the university of hyderabad in as in the department of history he got his phd from the university of wisconsin usa his research interests are in the field of modern south indian history particularly the history of the telugu speaking people in the erstwhile madras presidency he teaches courses pertaining to the field of modern indian history and on russian revolution he has authored many articles for journals like social scientist indian economic and social history review along with studies in history which include the rhetorical strategy of an autobiography reading satyavati's amat atma charitamanu atma charitamu i am sorry if i am getting the pronunciation wrong fashioning modernity in telugu vire silingam and his interventionist strategy to name a few uh, for the audience who have tuned in on youtube and for the audience here that we have on zoom uh, there's a little uh, i request the others to keep to be muted so today's the order of today's event will be as follows dr sherman will introduce the core themes of the book through a ppt followed by professor rajagopal who will interact with the author exploring these themes if time permits we will open it for the audience to ask questions through the chat box those who have logged in on zoom are requested to post their questions in the zoom chat box and the others on youtube there are a cube chat box these will be conveyed here on the on the zoom call this discussion as mentioned earlier will be simultaneously going live on the youtube channel manamanchi pustakam i request the youtube viewers to actually go call their peers and others who are interested to join in this discussion and to tune in for today's session over to you doctor great well thank you so much um kira and viraya and everyone at manamanchi pustakam for this invitation and for that very lovely introduction i should i should correct you that, that along and say that a long time ago i learned konchum konchum telugu and um anni machi payanu machi payanu i forgot it all uh so i'm afraid i can't really understand much anymore much to my own shame so uh thank you for this invitation i'm not going to speak for too long because it's hard to it's hard to listen for a long time on 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 zoom or or on youtube let me share my screen um right can you see that okay give me a thumbs up dira yeah great okay so this book is um my third project and it really has its origins as many book projects do in my second project which was a study of see if that's working Ching, there we go Um it was actually a study of Hyderabad state after the police action in 1948. And at that time, so this is a uh, research I was doing between around 2008 and 2015. And I was looking at what happened to the Muslims in Hyderabad state 
um, after the police action. And of course, as I was looking at what happened to Muslims in Nehru's India, I was reading about secularism uh, at the time. And of course, from the late 20th century, there's been a lot of discussion about Indian secularism, what it meant, what it achieved, what it didn't achieve. Sorry, I've got very loud traffic. I don't know if you can hear it, but I hope not. Um, but I found that uh, there was a debate about Indian secularism that didn't fit what I was finding in the archive. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with that debate. So on the one hand, you have Congress and many associated with Congress who would argue that Indian secularism was a massive success in the 40s and 50s and 60s, that it, it largely worked, that the Muslims who stayed in India found a sense of belonging and were able to participate in Indian life as equal citizens. And on the other side of that debate, you have the BJP arguing that actually all of that was pseudo-secularism because the Muslims were given outsized privileges that they didn't deserve at all. I found that none of that really fit with what I saw happening in Hyderabad in the 1940s and 50s. In fact, in the aftermath of the police action in 1948, there was widespread violence against Muslims, their properties, and their places of worship. And although Nehru and those around him, like Maulana Azad, called for their rehabilitation and for, for example, mosques to be rebuilt after they were destroyed. Largely, the Muslims in Hyderabad did not get the rehabilitation that they were promised by Delhi. In fact, they remained in a very precarious and anxious position throughout the 1950s. And so what I was seeing didn't fit with how people spoke about secularism in the 21st century. And I thought to myself, well, if this is true of secularism, if the way we in the 21st century speak about secularism is not how it really worked in the 40s and 50s, maybe that's true of all the different elements or most of the different elements of what's called the Nehruvian consensus. And so then I turned in my next project to look at the, the elements of the Nehruvian consensus. So non-alignment, secularism, socialism, the strong state, the successful democracy, and high modernism in India. My aim then in this work has been to understand how the people at the time defined these terms, debated them, and used them. I wanted to explore how they, people disagreed about the meaning of concepts, right? Rather than assuming that however Nehru defined socialism or secularism was the way everyone defined socialism or secularism, I teased out the different meanings that these terms had at the time. I also, in the work, tried to explore the projects that were underpinned by these ideas. And I sought to discover how, by the end of the period, people at the time evaluated these projects, their successes and their failures. I also wanted to ask, is that all there was? We have these five or six abstract nouns and, and nothing else to characterize this era. Um, well, the good news is there's a lot more to characterize the era. So the result was this book, Nehru's India, A History in Seven Myths. The title, by the way, is, um, is a homage to a different book um, called Seven Myths of the Spanish Conquest, which when I was doing some teaching a long time ago, really influenced my teaching about 16th century um, Mexico. Uh, and so although it's a real provocation in India these days, um, it, it's, a, it's an homage to, to a true scholar uh, and a, an, a, an approach to, to doing history. So what I would like to ask you to do is to not look at the table of contents and then conclude that, oh, she's arguing Nehru's India wasn't secular, it wasn't socialist, it wa didn't, you know, that is not my argument. I'm not trying to traduce everything that um, Nehru was associated with, nor am I trying to disparage his ideas um, or, or the man himself. I argue, as I say in the conclusion, that each of these is a myth, but each is a myth in their own way. So some, for example, like non-alignment, are a myth because there was an object object there, an aim, that was never really achieved. Um, and I argue with respect to non-alignment that India was born into the capitalist system because it was born out of the British Empire. And so it had this material entanglement with the US and with the capitalist world that it could never really balance with no matter how many positive 
visits they had from Soviet officials or how hard they tried to work to get Soviet aid. Some of these are myth because we in the 21st century misunderstand the term. This is the case with the myth of socialism. So since the 1950s, uh, critics of socialism have been arguing that all socialism leads invariably to Soviet style socialism, where the state controls every aspect of social, political and economic life. Well, it turns out there were lots of different ways to be socialist in the 20th century and Indians developed their own form of socialism. So we often misunderstand Indian socialism because we are expecting it to live up to ideals that set by the Soviet Union that Indians themselves never set for themselves. So there's a misunderstanding about the term socialism. And in some cases, there is a myth because uh, the, the, the things that we think were meant to happen never, never really were intended at all. So the idea that Nehru was the architect of independent India, that he ruled alone, that he set everything out in the plans and oversaw and implemented all of it almost single-handedly. That's, that's a myth. He never wanted to rule like that. And the same is true of high modernism as a kind of alien outside idea of modernity that was imposed upon India against India's will. That was never the intention of the modernist project. So I don't have time today to take you through all the myths. At various points, I've, I've, I've taken an hour to go through secularism or socialism or the strong state. So in instead, today, what I'd like to do is to introduce you to the first myth, the myth of Nehru, the architect of independent India, and discuss a little bit his style of rule. And I want to provide you with an alternative characterization of the period, because the other thing I don't want you to do is to walk away from this, from this talk and think, oh, well, if I can't use secularism, socialism, if I can't talk about Nehruvianism in the way I have spoken about it, then I don't know what to think about it. So I want to give you a set of characterizations for the period that I think more accurately reflect um, how uh, the, the nature of the period. So let's then turn to that first myth of Nehru the architect. Um, I want to ask, to what extent was Nehru involved in building this myth that he was the architect of independent India? And uh, I'm going to answer that unsurprisingly in the negative. I'm going to suggest that he wasn't involved in building that myth. And so I'm going to ask then, how was the myth propagated? And why? So we begin then with the question of whether Nehru developed a personality cult for himself to serve his own political ends. I, I want to ask this question because it has been alleged that Nehru did propagate a cult of personality. It was alleged by some serious scholars, and also um, it's also been alleged by, by the BJP and their followers in a kind of both sides argument about Modi. So the, the, the allegation against Modi is that he's developing a cult of personality, and the, his defenders would then argue, oh, well, Nehru did too, so therefore they imply it's okay. So there are these allegations, some serious from scholars and some political about a personality cult. And so to investigate the question of whether or not Nehru developed a personality cult, I want to rely on Frank de Cotter's book, How to Be a Dictator, great, great title there. He defines a cult of personality as having four characteristics. He says, one, a cult of personality elevates a single man above others. Two, it imbues his leadership with a mystical air. Three, the cult of personality requires the strict regulation, of the production of imagery of the leader. And four, it requires a ruthless demand for loyalty. Does Nehru fit any of that? Well, his most comprehensive and persuasive biographer, Sarvapali Gopal, records Nehru's own introspection and ambivalence about his own power. He was known to like a joke about himself. Stalin, not keen on jokes about Stalin. He's a very different character, Nehru. Nehru professed to being, quote, allergic, named after himself. And in fact, he had to plead with um, his public to, ask, to stop requesting that they ask him to, to name their library or their um, municipal center after him. So in, in fact, in 1957, Nehru was approached with the idea 
of a book of extracts from his speeches, which was to be titled, quote, Here is Wisdom. This was a kind of little red book, even before Mao's little red book came out. So there were, the idea was that there would be a little quote from Nehru for every, every occasion. Nehru cavilled at the idea, called it, quote, pompous. He wouldn't have a little red book because he was not keen to uh, turn his ideas into ideology. In fact, all impulses towards iconization were directed towards Gandhi in the Nehru years. So if Nehru didn't propagate the myth that he was the sole architect of independent India, who did? Where did it come from? Um, well, in the book, I detail that um, an event in 1957 where Nehru asked the Congress party for permission to retire or at least take a sabbatical of six months. And the Congress party tells him, no, they can't possibly do without his leadership at this crucial time in the country's history. They refuse him permission to retire and they call him the undisputed, indispensable architect of independent India. But I argue that the myth really expanded after Nehru's death. And it, almost instantly, in the few days after he passed away, you see the proliferation of Nehru iconography. So the Municipal Corporation of Delhi, for example, renamed the circular road Jawaharlal Nehru Marg uh, within a few days of his death. The first commemorative coin was issued. The post office issued its first stamp. Here on this slide, I have the second stamp issued. And it's really a remarkable image of Nehru because we see him in profile without his famous Gandhi cap, looking like a Roman emperor. And I, I reading what I know about Nehru, I, I wouldn't claim, I, I do suggest that I know a fair bit about Nehru's India, but I haven't, I'm not a comprehensive biographer of Nehru, but I would suggest that Nehru would never have let this image pass had he been alive, because it presents him as an emperor, uh, like a Roman emperor, and he would not have approved of that. At condolence meetings, leaders led thousands of ordinary Indians in taking a pledge, quote, to follow Mr. Nehru's ideal. Exactly that kind of pledge would not have been allowed just a few days earlier when Nehru was alive. My suggestion is that when the Congress party has been most unsure of itself, and especially of its leadership, it has relied most heavily upon the myth of Nehru, the architect of independent India. And so we see that when Indira's leadership is most in peril in 1984, for example, we see her drawing on her father's legitimacy in order to bolster her own. And the same goes um, throughout the years since Nehru's death. I also would argue that political parties all the way up to today have had an important role to play in propagating the myth of Nehru the architect. Now, this is true certainly of the Congress party, so they have produced endless volumes of, of, um, about for, for children uh, entitled, you know, Chacha Nehru uh, for adults um, commemorating the, the great man. And, and they used to laud him in statements now every year on his birth anniversary and death anniversary, of course, they tweet about him being the architect of independent India. But I also argue that the BJP has also helped propagate the myth of Nehru, the architect of independent India. They've been very critical of him, but they've, and they've set themselves apart from him or tried to do so. But in so doing, they have put him on a pedestal, if only to knock, try to knock him off. And in trying to contrast everything they do with what the, and imbuing all the mistakes of the Congress party in uh, sorry, and investing all the mistakes, as they regard them, of the Congress party in one man, they have, I argue, imbued Nehru with more power than he had when he was alive. So why have they done this? Well, because a nemesis without power is no villain at all. So they have helped elevate him, if only to vilify him. How then did Nehru see himself? I argue in the book that he saw himself as having four roles as educator, mediator, symbol of the ideals that he represented for himself and for India, and as patron. But as he's been lauded as the architect of independent idea, India, the ideas associated with him have become reified. They've become myths. I argue that they've lost their explanatory power 
because they've been repeated so much. So what I want to do today is to provide you with an alternative set of characterizations of the Nehru years, because I don't want you to walk away thinking, oh, what do I think of Nehru, Nehru's years now? How do I describe them if, I, if secularism isn't quite right, if socialism has been misunderstood? So I have six characterizations for you, and I really am not going to take that long, I promise. Okay. So the first characterization is that this is an age of experimentation. Too much of the historiography assumes that Nehru said, therefore it was. And there's a kind of um, ex post imposition of ideological conformity on this era. Far from being an era of ideological conformity, this was an age of experimentation. Here, we have Nehru acting as patron. What does that mean? When bright, enthusiastic individuals approach Nehru with an idea to solve one of India's problems, Nehru leapt at the opportunity to let someone else solve India's problems. So here we have a collage of um, uh, pictures. And of course, in the bottom right, we've got his sister, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit. Uh, bottom left, we've got Molana Azad, acting as education minister. Top right, um, we have Mahalanovas, the famous statistician. Um, and at the top left, we have Durgabai Deshmukh and her husband, Sidi Deshmukh. Um, and each of them had their own project, their own idea for how to solve one or many of India's problems. And Nehru let them work. He preferred to work through others. Each of these individuals undertook what they saw as experiments. And the word experiment appears in almost every letter uh, and certainly in all the reports about them at the, of the 1950s and 60s. And in these experiments, these Indians used all of the tools of mid-century social science. So they invariably started with a small pilot program, and then that was evaluated, and then uh, it was rolled out to a larger area, and then the program was again evaluated, and then rolled out across the country. So there's no big bang policy changes in the, after the constitution. Instead, we have the slow, iterative ideas emerging from these experiments. Here, the planning commission, I argue, is important, not because it planned everything and implemented all of its plans, but because it oversaw these pilots and evaluated them through its program evaluation organization. This experimental approach was evident in every er area of policy, from community development, to statistics, to social welfare, and even international relations. So that is, in fact, my next characterization of the era. I argue that India in this period had a comfortable internationalism about it, and this had three aspects. First, Indian diplomats, so not just Nehru. There is a tendency to substitute Nehru for India, especially when it comes to foreign policy, to talk about Nehru's approach to Korea or India's approach to Korea as if the two are the same. But I, like many scholars who have recently published, I stress that the Foreign Service was full of like-minded individuals who shared similar principles, but who didn't always take orders from Delhi, in part because they were accomplished in their own fields. And so they went off and kind of did their own thing, often without permission from Nehru or people in the Ministry of External Affairs. Together, these diplomats, including Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, um, they had a vision for international order. That vision centered around unwinding imperialism in all its legacies and working for peace based on cooperation and the elaboration of a rules-based international order. I also argue that this vision was attentive to people to an extent that other scholars have not recognized. It was attentive to people in a positive way in the sense that it was keen to secure, to understand, to measure, and to um, implement the will of the people. But it was also attentive to people in the sense that it wanted to pin them down, to gain their loyalties and to secure them to one country. Uh, and that often had a disciplinary element to it. This vision for international order, I argue, was more creative and more ambitious than non-alignment would allow. The second aspect of India's comfortable internationalism was that India was happy to take on international expertise in this period, but they were not subservient to that expertise. 
So here I've got in the in the bottom right, I've got Le Corbusier, the famous Swiss architect. And he's kind of a classic example that's trotted out as um, foreign modernism being imposed on India. But if you actually look at the meeting that took place between Le Corbusier and the Planning Commission, something entirely different emerges. So in April 1952, Le Corbusier met the Planning Commission for the first time. And almost as soon as he walked in the room, the Planning Commission said to him, you know high-rise buildings won't work in India. And for those of you who don't know, Le Corbusier was famous for building high-rise buildings. And so as soon as he walks in the room, they tell him, we, we, we don't want what you're famous for. And in fact, they barrage Le, Le Corbusier with questions about using mud and bamboo uh, and instead of reinforced concrete. Um, and they tell him that they actually want him to use Chandigarh uh, to train Indian architects. And this is a, a model for how India used international expertise in the Nehru years. They wanted it to be molded to Indian circumstances um, and used to train Indians, but in collaboration with Indians, not uh, as an outside alien imposition. And what you find is Le Corbusier hardly spent any time in Chandigarh. There were two um, British architects, Maxwell Fry and his wife Jane Drew, who spent a long time in Chandigarh. And in fact, rather than them imposing themselves on Chandigarh, Chandigarh imposed itself on them. You find that their ideas about architecture, about what was important in architecture, were fundamentally altered by their time spent with India. And I would argue that they are ex um, their, their experience is widespread across experts who come to India in the mid 20th century. The third aspect of this comfortable internationalism was that India saw itself as leading the decolonizing world and it actively sought to spread the Indian experience to other decolonizing countries. So India not only took on experts from abroad, but sent its own experts abroad. So we have in the 1950s and 60s, India uh, sending experts abroad on e and lecturing the world on everything from democracy to dam building or independence. So here, the middle picture here is uh, the diplomat Apapant, who, Apapant, who was in East Africa and then moved to Tibet um, and fostered ideas of independence or autonomy in both places. Okay, so the third characterization of the period is that popular participation remained important in the Nehru years. There is an allegation in the scholarship that Nehru and the elites around him monopolized initiative, wanted the state to do everything for the people, and they demobilized the national movement and told all people to basically sit down, let the state do its work. The records in the archives simply don't bear this out. There were constant efforts to get Indians, especially in rural areas, to participate in nation building. Um, the image here is from Kurukshetra, the magazine uh, for community development, which is the main mode through which Indians were asked to build their own communities in rural areas. Community development was reinvented several times, as you can see here in this image. And the idea is that the government's role in the development of communities in rural areas would become less and less. So the, the broken down pram there is the government program with the people's participation. You have the rocking horse, that's the people's program, with the government assistance. And then the third one is um, after Panchayati Raj is first introduced in 1959, the idea being that people govern themselves and the, and the central government has little to do. That's an ideal, uh, almost, um, yes, and, and, but, but that is, it captures some of the ambition of the era. The idea is, why, so why? Why did, why did the government do this? Well. First, uh, it has to do with the fiscal austerity of the time. There was so much work to do and just not enough money for any of it. And they, there was this myth propagated in part or taken over in part from British colonialism that people in the countryside were idle. They had, quote, spare time. And so if they could mobilize the people in the countryside, then they could make use of what they perceived to be spare time um, and get basically free, free labor for development. So part of the reason the government 
pushed so much initiative onto people was uh, because of fiscal austerity. Another reason is that labor was regarded as good for the development of one's personality. So we think here of Gandhi's constructive program, how important it was to use one's hands as a way of building one's personality. And that is certainly carried over into the way Indian socialists thought about work at the time. So I argue in the book that the bigger the issue was, the more likely it was to be devolved to people. So for example, um, just about 10 years after the constitution was inaugurated, everyone woke up to the fact that they had promised universal primary education in the, in the constitution and they hadn't done anything about it. Uh, and so as they are coming up on this deadline for themselves, they decide that the only way to, for, for India to get universal primary education is to make villages set up their own school. That's a huge, huge task for everyone. I want to emphasize here that this is a complex dance, right? That it's not so simple as just handing things over to, to people's committees um, in a kind of anarchic way. We have here the governments asking people to demand certain things of the government, but the government also creating a short list of the things that people can ask. Yeah, so they're, they're trying to, excuse me, they're trying to mobilize initiative, but also shape what that initiative would look like. So it's, it is a patronizing, um, hierarchical, top-down approach to, it, to inspiring local initiative. It's contradictory as that sounds. Okay, so this obsession with popular participation extends also to private enterprise. This is the fourth characterization of the era. So um, rather than it, it is certainly the case that um, license permit Raj was a pain for all those private enterprises, but rather than wanting to obstruct them and shut them down as far as possible, in fact, during the Nehru years, uh, the governments were keen to get private enterprise to make themselves quote, part of the plan. So in 1955, Congress famously passed its resolution in the Avadi session calling for um, the creation of a socialistic pattern of society. And almost as soon as they passed that resolution, Nehru went and spoke to the FICCI, the meeting of India's biggest industrialists, and said, oh, don't worry about words. Don't get, don't get caught up, socialism, capitalism, don't worry about it. What we want you to do, Nehru explained to the industrialists, we want you to look at the plan's targets and work towards them. And this is exactly what this ad is, is showing us that private industrialists did. So this is an ad from... I believe, so it's Times of India, 1958, and here the second plan has promised that India will produce a whole lot more steel, but it's not doing that from state-run steel plants, in part because those state-run steel plants are not up and running yet. So who do they rely on? They rely on Tata and Tisco to, to build that extra, to produce that extra steel. Um, and the magazines of the late 50s and early 60s are actually full of ads from private enterprises saying, look how we're contributing to the plan. Look how we're helping national development. The second way that private enterprise was asked to um, make itself part of the plan was to pay taxes. They were a lot less willing to do this. Uh, the third way that corporate com big corporate companies were asked to contribute to India's socialism was through corporate social welfare. So in the 1950s, it was very popular for companies to set up townships where they provided housing, schools, playgrounds, and, and all, the, all the facilities necessary to live in urban life. Of course, Tata had been the pioneer of that in Jamshedpur, but it becomes much more popular in the 1950s and encouraged by the government. Um, the idea here is that I argue that uh, in the industry was nationalist, not nationalized. And they were asked to look after their workers and not just their profits. In return, this was a pretty good bargain for them because they got protections from global market. They got help with inputs uh, and as well as help with quality control market. So it was a pretty good, so I would argue that India in the Nehru years was actually pro-business, albeit selectively so. Um, 
And that there is a very fine and important distinction to be made between being pro-business and pro-market. And it's the kind of market fundamentalists who look at the Nehru years and argue that, oh, because they weren't pro-free market, they were anti-business. And I think that's uh, that's not a fair distinction that they make. That's some of the arguments they make. Okay, fifth and penultimate characterization of the era is that there was a reluctance to use the colonial administration period. If you read the speeches of the administrators, of the politicians, of everybody, almost everyone from the lowest official to the highest, you see in the 50s and 60s, they were very critical of their colonial inheritance. This is very different from the existing historiography, which argues that Basically, Nehru and those around him, they inherited the administrative apparatus of the Raj and they just took it over and started using it because they were happy, in part because they had to use it. Um, but actually, they were very unhappy with their inheritance. So here's a quote from Zakir Hussain just before he becomes um, vice president of India, speaking to uh, a, a group of students uh, graduating from the Indian Institute of Public Administration. He says, uh, the colonial administration and the current Indian administration is known for its forbidding, quote, touch me not attitude. You all have, he said, they have a standoffish sense of superiority and, quote, a lack of initiative to boot. So what Congress tried to do in the 50s and 60s was to create a new kind of administrator, one who wasn't so reluctant or skeptical of government plans, one who embraced government projects enthusiastically. And I argue in a show in the book that this in fact created a set of administrators which are really quite pro-Congress. Doesn't prove a problem until you have the first change of administration, which happens in 1957 when communists are elected in Kerala. And then it's when the communists decide that they would like more enthusiastic administrators. They would like administrators who uh, don't oppose their plans that they begin to oust those Congress, pro-Congress administrators and bring in pro-communist administrators, that's when you begin to have a problem um, with this approach to the administration. The second aspect of this reluctance to use the colonial administration is that all of the seminal projects of the early 1950s in particular were built at a distance from the existing administration. So, Almost uniformly, everything important to Nehru, Durgamai Deshmukh, um, SK Day, all the people around Nehru, Molana Azad, everything they set up were all uh, they, it was all set up as autonomous bodies. Almost always set up by the, a resolution of the government of India, not by legislation. This meant that they weren't subject to oversight by the Lok Sabha. And they didn't have the, they weren't integrated into the ordinary administration. And this was absolutely intentional because the ordinary administration was seen as obstructivist uh, and rigid and unable to uh, be democratic enough to respond to the needs of the people and introduce the programs as required. So everything from the planning commission to the central social welfare board to public enterprises, um, to the, the Modar Valley Corporation um, and other, other key areas like the Faridabad Development Board, they were all at a distance from this existing administration. Now, that tendency is uh, with, withdrawn a bit in the late 1950s. They begin to pull back and things that are unsuccessful get wound down and these autonomous bodies that are successful get wound into the ordinary administration. So it's not a matter that it's not a fact. It's not a matter of everything always being built at a distance, but a kind of ebb and flow where they're, kind of, where they're rolling out experiments um, uh, as autonomous bodies and then pulling them back in. Okay, final characteristic um, is that this was the pinnacle of power for India's elites, yeah. And they were largely aware of their own privilege. So they didn't tend to lord it over others or protect it in a kind of preemptive form of resentment. They operated in pedagogic mode. They would regularly speak of seeking to, quote, uplift those who were less fortunate than them. We can recognize this now as deeply patronizing and even offensive language 
but they used their position to try to transform India. And they understood that the revolutions that they were calling for would have consequences they could, that they could neither foresee nor fully control. Um, so, here we go. Uh, I want to say, by way of conclusion, I'll give you a little anecdote that uh, I had a very interesting conversation with a man on an airplane about um, politics and India uh, in, the, in the narrow years. And I ended up giving this man, Mr. Sharma, my uh, my book to read because I actually had other work to do, and I was like, I can't, I can't continue this conversation. This is a long flight, but I have, I have to write an, I have to write a, a lecture. So I gave him my book to read, and after reading the first sentence or two, he raised an objection. He said, oh, "I don't like this word." He had a quibble with a the word. Then he read another half page. He had a quibble with quibble with a sentence. He disagreed with one thing or another. You read mo about, probably about a third of the book in about two hours. And after, after he had read that, his objections quieted down a little bit. And he said, this is very interesting. He said, on the one hand, I have to hold everything I know about Nehru on this side of my brain. And on the other hand, I have to hold all the arguments in your book and all the evidence that you present on the other side of my brain. And it was a real challenge for him. But actually, I admire him because he liked the challenge and, and he, he took it up. And so I, I also hope that all of you may not agree with everything that I've said, but I hope you will enjoy the challenge uh, of hopefully new ideas and new evidence presented about the narrative at the end of my speech. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor Sherman. It was lovely to hear you. It was a very interesting guide to the reading of that book so that a lot of people who actually are unaware of the context of this book, it was a very interesting way to introduce themselves to this book. It was also, I mean, uh, personally, it was interesting to hear how the personas were deconstructed, the personas that you normally associate Nehru with, those were deconstructed and his entire garb of a particular right, Nehruvian ideology has been unveiled. Thank you so much for that. Moving on to uh, Professor Rajagopal. Sir, over to you. Sir, you're on mute. Uh, yes. I was, uh, am I audible now? Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, I'm trying to find out what kind of time we have. Uh, there is about another half an hour. Okay, okay. That, it's good to know. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'll say whatever I want to say at one go, you know, not taking too much time, maybe 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, and then we'll give a chance for uh, Taylor to respond. And hopefully we can also bring in other uh, responses and comments. So it's a, a very interesting book and then I'm happy about the opportunity to discuss uh, Taylor Sherman's book today. Uh, and uh, she has uh, said fairly clearly that, uh, you know, myth always uh, contains a grain of truth, but, uh, you know, you must not mistake it for the, the entire reality. You know, there is quite a bit of uh, deviation, uh, distance, you know, between the myth and the reality. And, uh, you know, it myth kind of simplifies things, but, uh, you know, reality is more complex. And you have to look at what happened between 1947 and 1964 as a much more complex story. So that is a very well taken point that uh, Taylor makes. Uh, so I want to raise a couple of uh, issues here about myths. You know, who are the people who propagated these myths about Nehru? You know, I would like to know. And then I also would like to know who benefited from these myths. Was it merely the Congress Party or was it you know, more people than Congress Party who benefited from the myths? Uh, and uh, or else are we going to, do we want to argue that, you know, myths have, uh, you know, their own, uh, you know, logic of uh, origination and their own logic of, uh, you know, spreading, you know, and they're not necessarily controlled or determined by 
people who might want to propagate them or who people who might like them you know uh, so those are some of the points and also the the related question is about why so many people chose to believe in these myths you know uh, among the people who believed in these myths there were clearly a number of uh, very very intelligent people who also chose to believe in in these myths about nehru about the early part of the history of independent india so i would like some light thrown on some of these uh, you know what what one might call uh, slightly theoretical questions about myths <laughs> then my next comment uh, pertains to non alignment you know non alignment uh, you know it as uh, taylor said you know it's much more an aspiration than a you know as a uh, reality but then you know think about india between 1947 and 1964 you know it didn't really matter in the in the you know in the uh, the affairs of the world you know it was a small newly independent country with very uh, small uh, economic uh, uh, you know uh, clout uh, and for a country that was just uh, starting out it uh, clearly helped not to take sides so there was a a practice of the the attitude of caution i am sure in not taking sides and you know to in being uh, uh, you know kind of uh, equidistant from the varying uh, the different power blocks but then uh, there was also the the habit of taking certain principled positions you know uh, uh, positions that supported uh, people who were uh, you know fighting against the colonial uh, you know still uh, persisting colonial rule uh, you know people supporting people who were fighting the interests of imperialism uh, you know castigating the the you know the stances of uh, racial and ethnic discrimination and so forth you know there there was something principled about the 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 you know the policy of non alignment uh, during that initial phase you know between 47 64 or even later for that matter and i want to contrast this uh, early non alignment early position of policy of non alignment with the kind of policy foreign policy that india is practicing today you know india is no longer small india is uh, somewhat big it is the the leader of the g20 nations right now you know and india is some something to be taken seriously uh you know also because the a lot of the western countries uh, see india as a as a able counter foil for uh, the the strength of china uh but then they kind of and then india as you know you know it's between russia on the one hand and the west on the other hand you know it is it takes a, a position of its own it doesn't align with any either of these power blocks but there is something opportunistic about the kind of position that uh, india is taking now you know a few days ago uh, there was an editorial in the financial times which said you know india is simply gorging on russian oil you know it is just buying the russian oil cheap and then it is exporting it to europe and other uh, parts of the world and making a lot of profit and you know a couple of years ago or maybe 3 years ago i am not entirely sure about the date you know indian government actually invited bolsonaro you know the the leader of brazil you know who is anti democratic who is dictatorial you know who is uh, a kind of a is an elected dictator of sorts uh, he they we invited bolsonaro as the chief guest in the republic day parade you know and then Prime Minister Modi goes to United States of America and then holds joint rallies with Donald Trump. Okay, you know, kind of violating protocol along the way. So this is kind of very opportunistic. You know, the Indian uh, equidistance from different power blocks, you know, as it was practiced in the initial phase, was based on some principles, whereas the Indian equidistance, as it is practiced today. is uh, is nothing but a you know uh, a an exercise in opportunistic politics i just wanted to make this comment on the 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 contrast between then and now
And on the topic of uh, secularism, I want to say that, uh, you know, while uh, as uh, Taylor said, you know, uh, the myth about Indian secularism of the Nehruvian era, uh, but the interesting point, you know, she makes this point in the book, you know, while there is a difference, but there is also a continuity of sorts between the Citizenship Act of 1955 and the Citizenship Amendment Act of 2019. You know, don't look at merely the difference, but look at the kind of uh, continuity uh, and the persistence of trends. And we have to, you know, if we want to call ourselves a secular country, we also have to look at how Muslims have been faring in independent India. And uh, the best uh, kind of description of, you know, account of how Muslims are doing can be found in the pages of the Rajinder Satyar Committee Report of 2005. You know, which says that, you know, Muslim representation is just not there. You know, Muslims constitute something between 15 to 20 percent of the Indian population. But look at jobs. Are there 15 percent Muslims in jobs? Are there 15 percent students in the universities? Are there 15 percent uh, Muslims among the faculty who are recruited to the universities? You know, this is uh, or even corporate jobs. You know, the, the, the record is uh, even more pathetic there, you know, uh, in, if you look at the, the employment uh, profiles of people who join the corporate sector, you know, you see that there are hardly any Muslims who are uh, able to find a, an opportunity to work in the corporate sector. And uh, Rajinder Sachar uh, committee goes on to comment that, you know, Muslims in India are perhaps doing worse than the untouchables, the scheduled caste. You know, scheduled caste at least have been able to achieve a certain uh, modicum of upward mobility because of the facility of affirmative action. You know, uh, some groups among them have uh, have kind of uh, gone up the, the ladder uh, to some extent at least. But Muslims, that, that is not the story of how Muslims have performed. And this is a very sad reflection of you know, how badly this Indian secularism has panned out, you know, over the, the decades. And then I want to also bring your attention to the a certain fact, which is very well documented, but a fact uh, which also has found place in Taylor's book, which is about, you know, the placing of the idols in 1949, you know, inside the, the, the mosque, the Ayodhya Ma mosque. So somebody comes and then places idols inside the mosque and then, you know, the somewhere there is, a, it's a comment on the ineffectiveness of the Prime Minister Nehru, it's a comment on the ineffectiveness of the Chief Minister of the Uttar Pradesh at that point, a point of time, Govind, Govind Vallabh Pant, that they just could not get the idols removed. You know, perhaps a, a, a kind of a courageous uh, step. Uh, at that point of time might have, you know, saved a lot that happened, you know, that ensued later. You know, th this is a kind of a critical comment on Nehru that I'm making. I'll make a few more critical comments, uh, not because I'm an admirer of the current uh, political dispensation in the country, but then you have to, you know, uh, look at uh, Nehru more objectively as, uh, as uh, Taylor has uh, you know, uh, sought to do it in her book. You know, uh, then I move on from the question of secularism to the question of socialism. There was never any any iota of doubt in the minds of, uh, you know, uh, keen observers about uh, the kind of regime that was going to, you know, uh, that was going to, you know, uh, usher, to be ushered in India after 1947. You know, there is a, a really very nice, insightful uh, review of Discovery of India, written by Nehru, by D.D. Koshyambi. You know, it uh, it's titled, uh, The Bourgeoisie Comes of Age in India. And it's a, a very nice review article, which is published in this uh, book, uh, which goes by the title of Exasperating Essays. You know, which he clearly says, you know, the time of capitalism has arrived in India. And Nehru is somebody who is announcing it, you know, through his, his uh, you know, 
famous book Discovery of India. And this is also a, a point which is made by the historian Parth Chatterjee much later in the book that he wrote, you know, the nationalist thought in the colonial world, you know, what was Nehru trying to push, you know, for the economic uh, improvement of India, economic development of India, modernization of India. He was pushing, uh, pushing the economic factor much more than he was pushing any other factor. And he was also pushing the, the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the significance of science and technology, you know, which are based on the operation and application of instrumental reason. And then there is a, as Chatterjee says, you know, there is a very clear connect between, between, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> between uh, capital on the one hand and reason on the other hand. You know, this is a historically demonstrated connection between capital and reason. This is exactly what Nehru was trying to push. So there is no illusion that any socialism was going to be introduced in India. Uh, but then when we say socialism, you know, this is a, a term which is uh, employed by uh, in the American political parlance also when the Republicans call the Democrats uh, socialists, you know, they talk about the role for the government and so forth. They talk about uh, progressive income taxation and so forth, right? You know, so we are what we are talking about. When we talk socialism, talk about uh, invoke the, the the term socialism. We are in you know in actuality we are invoking the term social democracy. You know, social democracies are all capitalist, but social democracies follow a set of prog progressive policies. You know that tend to you know. Uh, help the the underprivileged sections of a society so what is one of the tenets of socialism as well as of uh, social democracy equal opportunity for all did nehru try to push it in the uh, 17 years that he was the prime minister of india did he you know as uh, there's a very interesting book which came after taylor sherman wrote, wrote her book this is a book by ashoka modi it's called India is broken, a people betrayed. It's a book, uh, 2023 publication from the Stanford University Press, where, uh, you know, I agree with, I concur with Modi, who argues that, you know, there was no focus on the provision of public goods in India. You know, there is an entire, a fairly detailed chapter on uh, the 17 years of the regime of the first prime minister. So that you know, there is no focus on public goods. There is there are no investments in affordable education and health. You know, if India could have been a a better social democracy, uh, we, let's discard the term socialism because it doesn't make any sense as we agreed. But if India was to be a an improved social democracy, you know, Nehru should have focused on some of these other things. You know, public goods, education, health, and so forth, which he clearly did not. And Ashoka Modi also says that they, he adopted a wrong strategy of heavy industry. You know, heavy industry, the setting up of heavy industry, the, the government uh, investment in heavy industry, which happened, you know, through the plants and th through the first 10 to 15 years of uh, the economic uh, story of independent India, it created very few jobs. You needed to create jobs. You needed to adopt a strategy that supported labor-intensive, you know, capital capital investment. But Nehru completely went against it, and this could be one of the, you know, uh, a tactical failures of Nehru. I mean, we are not saying you know Nehru did that on purpose, or you know he somehow felt you know he did not really adequately appreciate the. The, the differing uh, outcomes of these different uh, industrial strategies, you know, uh, the the first one being the uh, the strategy that favored uh, investment in heavy industry, the other being the strategy that would uh, be uh, much more favorable to uh, labor intensive investment. So, you know, they, we have to evaluate whether that was a mistake. And then clearly in the eyes of Ashoka Modi, it's a mistake to have pushed the the strategy for heavy industry. And so far as democracy, it's another very interesting point, you know, chapter on democracy that Taylor has written. And then, you know, there is the the drawing of the connection between caste and democracy, which is 
which happened then, which is happening now, which the connection has only gotten deeper over the decades, uh, and the connection between money and democracy. And then, you know, there are instances where, you know, the, even Taylor mentions in the book that, you know, uh, Congress is collecting funds from rich people. And then Nehru is also, you know, taking a personal interest in uh, garnering funds, uh, you know, which are to be collected from rich people. Uh, so there is a lot of campaign money which is coming in from the rich. And then obviously there is a quick, quick pro quo. Whenever that happens, you have to formulate and implement pal policies that are going to favor the rich. You know, if you are taking money from the rich to conduct your campaigns. And this is something not merely, not a, a, a situation that comes to light, comes to prominence only after 1947. This is a story of the elections of 1937. You know, in the aftermath of the passage of the Government of India Act of 1935, in the very first elections which were conducted, who were the people who got, you know, the seats, who got to contest the seats? Was it the people who laid down their lives, you know, for the sake of uh, the country? Or was it people who had access to resources and people who could fight these elections by using, you know, by resorting to money, power and so forth? So uh, that was that is another part of the problem of democracy in India, and also you know whenever uh, uh, you know the government of India formulated policies which appeared the more pro poor, you know in terms of their intent, in in terms of their uh, language and appearance, you know they they remain merely tokenistic. You know, uh, you you implemented a set of policies. You know, they, they they were populist. You know, they they were policies that could be uh, used in in the electoral camp electioneering and campaigning. But these were not policies. You know, which were not going which are going to benefit the people. But because there was never a focus on an effective implementation of those policies. Uh, you know, uh, like land reforms. You know, look at the way land reforms in principle is a good policy, but how was it implemented in different parts of India? So why was it not implemented in the way that it should have been? You know, you paid a certain lip service and then you allowed for a lapse in the implement strict uh, implementation of those policies. So this is the comment on democracy. And then what, what I found very interesting in uh, forming an assessment about Nehru is the significance, you know, the, the 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 highlighting by Taylor about Nehru as an educator. You know, Nehru as an educator, Nehru would have been a brilliant professor, perhaps if he joined a university. Uh, Nehru would have been a, an effective. He was an effective opposition leader who spearheaded headed the freedom movement. But was that going to make him? An effective politician, an effective administrator. Politician, yes, he drew people, you know, crowds. He was charismatic. He spoke uh, his uh, Hindi and Urdu well. He spoke his English well, and all of that is correct. But was he an effective administrator? So, you know, there is a, a kind of a <laughs> implication here. You know, if Nehru is a, an effective educator, you know, why did he write all of those letters to the chief ministers? You know, and produce the you know, a corpus of materials that runs into scores of volumes of selected works or collected works, whatever the case is. You know, he, he, who read those things? Who got really got influenced by all of that which was produced by Nehru? You know, he should have probably just turned to doing things. So he was, was he more of a talker than a doer? And this is a point which is again made by Ashoka, uh, what's his name? Uh, Ashoka Modi. You know, he, he brings, you know, this is obviously a, a well-known contrast which is drawn between Nehru and Patel. You know, Patel was alive only for three years after independence, but then he had the track record of uh, showing his effective leadership in, uh, you know, in integrating the princely states and so forth. You know, he talked less, you know, he, even though he also went to the UK for his uh, legal training and he did more, whereas it turns out that Nehru talked much more than he might have and uh, was not quite effective in delivering the goods you know, for the country. So this is a kind of a, you know, uh, a, but this is my final comment. 
you know, uh, this is uh, some kind of a hypothetical question. How could, how Nehru might have done something different? You know, was it heavy industry? Was it a mistake? The strategy of promoting heavy industry was was that a mistake? Should he have, should he have focused more on creating uh, more jobs? You know, uh, or uh, you know. Was there somebody else who could have been the Prime Minister of India, who could have done things differently? You know, we st still ask these questions about ne Nehru's leadership and effectiveness. Not because, you know, we are assuming Nehru to be all-powerful. Not because we are considering, we are thinking that there are not a whole lot of impersonal forces at play, you know, that can defeat the intentions of any individual. Uh, not because there was the larger context was very different and then you know Nehru could only Nehru or any other individual could uh, you know could only go only thus far and no further given all the you know limitations that would operate on a person of that kind but to the extent uh, that as uh, historians we comp don't completely neglect the the significance of the role of individuals we, we, since we believe that individuals uh, can make a difference and have from time to time made a difference, you know, we would like to ask this question, you know, what might Nehru have done differently or what might somebody else in Nehru's shoes might have done differently to achieve a result that was far more optimistic than how it turned out to be at the time of the year 1964. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Sherman, would you like to respond? Or there are actually a couple of other questions. Uh, do you want to hear those questions as well and respond collectively? Um, so can I, I'll just I'll take, take two one minute to respond, if that's okay. And then I'll leave not a problem, you. just your convenience. Um, Raja Gopal, I wish we could have a, uh, I wish we could sit and have a cup of chai and, and, and talk near and, and really, really get to the bottom of all this, because those are really great comments. So thank you. I mean, I just want to start by, by taking up this question of being critical of Nehru, um, because it ties to your first questions about who propagated the myths and who benefited from the myths. And I, I think the, the number one person who was critical of and skeptical and, um, worried uh, uh, and had a sort of sense of anxiety about Nehru, the number one person was Nehru. He himself was very critical. He was very self-critical. He had a lot of doubts. He was constantly worried whether he was doing the right thing, constantly feeling like uh, the country wasn't necessarily going in the direction he was hoping it was going in. That's part of the reason he wanted to retire in 1958. Um, and so I think, you know, I've, been, I've had a few back and forth over email with a couple of people who call themselves Nehruvians. And I always say to them, the truest way to be a Nehruvian is, is to be critical of Nehru, not in an unthinking, everything he did was wrong kind of way, but to be reflective about what worked and what didn't, because he was a very reflective person and he was the, he would be the last person to suggest that everything he did was right. Um, and so then if I, if I can skip quickly to your question about who benefited and who hasn't benefited from this valorization of Nehru, I think Congress has has not been helped by lionizing Nehru in the way that they right because when 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 people criticize Nehru and Congress jumps to his defense uh, uncritically defending him they're they're basically un showing themselves to be unwilling to look at the past uh, in a balanced way and unwilling to acknowledge, Nehru himself would have done, unwilling to not acknowledge that there were some mistakes, that he could have done things better, that this didn't work out, or that didn't work out the way he had. And so, actually, I think one of the, one of the um, most interesting side effects of, of the ne propagation of the Nehru myth has been upon the Congress party. Um, so, I, I, I would love to go through your points Point by point, I, I do want to just answer too quickly. Um, who propagated the myth? Every myth has its own has its own set of propagators. For example, the myth of non-alignment is really propagated by the Americans. Who, when India says they're not taking sides, the Americans ignore everything they know about India. They 
<laughs> they ignore all the experts they have in India. They ignore all the money they send to India. They ignore all the help they, they give to India. All the exchanges on every uh, every level from artists to experts and believe that that India could at any moment go over to the Soviet. So they're they're great at, at propagating the myth of, of non-alignment. There are different different characters who propagate each of the myths. And I just want to come quickly to socialism. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll say I'll, I won't answer your last point because it's impossible. But socialism, I think it's really with seventy five years of hindsight, it's really easy to say, "Oh, this didn't work. That didn't work." But I think if we take if we take Indian socialism on its own terms in the forties and fifties, they really genuinely were trying to do something different in a different way. Um, and we can look at it now and see how ineffective it was. Um, so, for example, they were trying to repurpose existing hierarchies rather than to obliterate existing hierarchies. So they didn't take all the middle income farmers like the Russians did and kill them all. Right? Um, instead, they asked those the middle, middle income farmers and the elites to, to use their privilege for the benefit of society. And things could have transpired differently. And there was no nothing. I mean, the logic of capital accumulation suggests that of course they weren't going to do that, but they were the Indian socialists didn't didn't ascribe to that kind of logic. So they were genuinely trying to set out on a new path, and I think it's unfair of us to go, "Oh, I was doomed from the beginning." Um, what could Nehru have done differently? This is such a good question and such an impossible one. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I wish I, I wish I had an answer, but I, I actually let me say that although the book is at various points points out the failures of one plan, one little project or another little project or. Uh, ineffectiveness of, of this foreign policy or, or that bit of the plan. Actually, I thought the man had a quite a little, quite a lot of integrity. Whenever I saw his name on a document, he was all, he always was very empathetic. He was always trying to act with integrity. Um, and part of the reason he couldn't get as much done as he wanted was he faced everyday insurrection from congressmen from all, all government officials at the lowest levels, at the highest levels. And so in some ways he was, um, well, you might call him too democratic, you might call him too, a bit of a pushover, um, but I think for a first leader, perhaps better to have somebody whose who's democratic inclinations are stronger than his other one. So um, not, not that I'm inclined, you know, I want to go back to the, circle back to my original comments about it's good to criticize Nero. It's good to be thoughtful about the past and balance the successes and failures rather than to jump to the end or to jump to, to uh, criticize everything. Okay, so we have some, some questions. Peter, I'm going to let you ask. Yeah, so uh, Professor Tirumali Inukonda, sir, I hope he can do that. I think Professor has not been able to unmute himself. Uh, Mr. Virya Kunduri had a question and he said he wanted to. Yeah. Yeah, before uh, uh, placing my question, there is a supplement. Uh, we are looking at the concept of non alignment from the political and ideological perspective. There is an academic aspect to that. That is where. Uh, uh, the industrialization or uh, big push towards the heavy industries and sourcing technologies internationally. This is the area where uh, Nehru played out uh, to his choice by uh, harping on the non-alignment movement. So he sourced technology and money as uh, Taylor uh, told uh, from America whenever it is necessary from Russia whenever it is necessary, even from Germany and other, other countries. So this aspect of non-alignment movement also should be brought into the uh, discussion. This is a supplement, I think. Uh, my question is, uh, we are talking about a myth-making. And we are talking about seven myths uh, that made the Nehru are unmade, un un unmaking of uh, modern India. But my question is whether this myth-making is particularly confined or limited to Nehruvian era or a Nehru even Congress uh, or Congress period because every political leader has his own 
uh, a kind of uh, spreading his own myths. We have seen uh, that in the case of uh, Indira Gandhi, and uh, we are witnessing now in India uh, how many myths are uh, being made. So what I feel, it's not only a limited uh, personal uh, personality enterprise; it's a craft, state craft. myth making is a state craft that's why the similar kind of uh, uh, happenings and uh, uh, constructing myths we can see in every uh, country and uh, in respect of uh, most of the leaders including uh, what uh, 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 rajgopal garu told about the bolsonaro so this should be seen as a part of the state craft then we would uh, be in a better position to understand the myths Yeah. Dera. Should I should I go ahead and answer that or do you want me to? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Go ahead. Yeah, please. Please. Um so uh on non-alignment this gives me a chance to circle back and include an answer to Roger Gopal's question as well. Um so to 100% there was an economic aspect to non-alignment and I would I I would go back to this question of material entanglement, right? So if we think about what non-alignment was, what it was meant to achieve, Uh, and what it couldn't achieve part of the limits of non alignment has to do with the fact that the india all of its economic sorry all of its military most of its economic ties and its um uh its cultural ties are all facing west and it didn't have hardly any ties to the soviet bloc or the soviet union um and those ties were very small and very tenuous through the nehru years Um so if we take military equipment for example they got hundreds 200 planes from France 200 from Britain 200 from the US how many how many airplanes combat airplanes did they get from the Soviets well it's just there's just no contest so materially they're so much more entangled with um the west than elsewhere and i think uh that explains a lot of i think what today we see as opportunism it can also be understood in terms of material entanglement right like india is much more dependent upon the chinese economy and upon the russian economy than it is, than it was in the nearer year so it has to be take some of its opportunistic position um and that you know lets me cut circle back to rajiv gopal's question about principal decisions your comments about principal decisions how india was able to support for example um independence movements elsewhere as a matter of principle and i would just ask answer that question with a question well does that you know just because they supported because they had a principle does that make them non aligned and actually i would argue that those principles were part of a larger indian um post imperial foreign policy it's much more interesting than being non aligned and much more ambitious than being non and and there were principles at stake there um now there i you make a very important point about myth making um and its connection to statecraft i i mostly agree with you 100% myth making is not limited to the nehru era uh you see it as an essential part of uh, any states person after they leave office so the americans for example they have a, each american president sets up their own presidential library um and that is concerned with overseeing their legacy and ensuring that their legacy is um presented in a certain way but also giving access to scholars to their papers and things and so um it's not in some ways that the congress party has lauded nehru as the architect is not unusual right I, find me in in a decolonizing country that hasn't done that um and all all big country and all countries uh lionize some of their leaders it's a, it's an essential part of statecraft to create narratives that that tell the story of one's leadership in a particular way and i guess part of what i would push back against in your question is the idea Yes, Nehru and his government created narratives. They told stories about what they were doing. But I would argue that most of the stories we tell now in the 21st century about what Nehru was doing are not the same story that Nehru told about what he was doing. 
Um, so when we think about the strong state, for example, we say, oh, Nehru and his government just inherited the strong state and they from the Raj and they took it over. That wasn't the story they were telling. They were, they were saying that we don't like the state we inherited. It's not strong. It's not effective. It's not democratic. We want to change it. Even where they took it over, they did so reluctantly and knowing all of its faults. They weren't telling the same story. So narrative is important, but it's important that we capture their narrative and not impose us, our own on, on the point. Um, okay. Uh, I have a question as well, but before I ask my question, uh, anybody who is attending the call right now, would they like to ask another question? I remember, okay, Tirumali sir is not here anymore. So my question is that, uh, like, the cult personality that you were talking about uh, when it comes to Nehru, it's safe to say that there is a cult personality that is following the current prime minister, the current political leaders. So when we are talking about these cult personalities, how was Nehru's cult personality different from today's prime minister? Modi's cult personality and not just the personality, but also the following, the cult following that these two leaders had. One is that, and second is that uh, certainly whenever a scholar or a researcher authors a book, the prime uh, aim is to like to open discussions, to start discussions and to open these stars that are going to reach out to or, ex or expand the research uh, landscape. But other than that, is there any change that as a, as an author you are expecting to bring through this book in indian in today's democracy in the indian it's a huge one but yeah go on uh, well let me say that um as a as a historian i'm much more interested in an accurate uh, description of the past than in in changing anything uh, today uh, i i I must say, I get a bit exhausted by the same debates again and again, the kind of Nehru good, Nehru bad, Nehru good, Nehru bad. So if people talk, begin speaking and using different examples and having a more sophisticated conversation about Nehru, I would be happy. Um, let me answer your question about the cult of personality. What, what is the difference between Nehru's and, and Modi's? Well, I, I don't think Nehru had a cult of personality. He doesn't fit those four characteristics of elevating an individual above others, investing him with a mystical air, uh, exercising control over his image, and exert, um, exacting loyalty from everyone. I don't think he he didn't meet those criteria. And um, all of the examples in de Couture's book are all from the mid-20th century, Stalin, Mao, etc. And Nehru wasn't in there. And I think there's a good reason. Uh, I think the difference, if there, if there was a kind of cultish following, then perhaps there are some important differences, I think, so between Modi and, and Nehru. So one, I think Modi does want a cult of personality to be propagated around him, right? He is naming things after himself. Um, he is elevating himself above others. Uh, he he does ask for, um, he does try to control his image and, and invest his own authority with ex uh, sometimes quite extraordinary power. What the, and the following that he gets is also quite different from the following that Nehru wanted. Okay, so they both, I think they both get a kind of adoring, some, sometimes, and, and definitely uncritical following. I think they both get that, yeah? Modi wants it. Nehru doesn't want uncritical following. So he says, in, as he's com uh, campaigning for the third general election in 1961, he's up in UP in Kanpur, and he meets people from the business community, and they're donating to him. And he says, thank you for your money, but I've heard you're giving to both to other political parties and the Congress. Well, I don't want your money unless you believe what I'm trying to convince you to believe in. And he does, he wants, he likes people's admiration, but he wants much more than her, their admiration. He wants to convince them of the logic of his thinking, of the reasons why to vote, they, why they should vote Congress. He wants to persuade people with the possibility, with the full possibility that they might be persuaded by some other politician. 
He's not as interested in unthinking loyalty, or at least that's what he publicly professes again and again and again. Thank you for your love, but I don't want your unthinking loyalty. So, I think that makes a, a, a quite a strong contrast, even if the actual following can be quite similar. Yes, thank you so much for answering our questions. And so to now we come to the end of today's session. I hope that this discussion will help the readers of the book for a better comprehension and also, as mentioned before, would lead to better research. And uh, as uh, Dr. Taylor had mentioned, that a person's success or failures will never be, can never be weighed one-sided. It can never be treated that way. There should be a balanced uh, perceptions of both, uh, per balanced understandings of both the sides, balanced, balanced assessments of their contributions of these historical personalities. And Professor Rajagopal Garu has brought in all the new lens that one can look at, uh, th look through uh, from to understand Nehru in a better manner. Uh, we'd like to personally thank Manamanchi Manu Manu Pustakam. Thanks, uh, Professor. Taylor Sherman and Raju Gopal sir for coming here today and for spending their time in discussing Nehru. Uh, we will hope to see you again for another book discussion, hopefully sometime soon. So the presenters will be receiving a link of this video that went on live uh, from the team of Manchi Pustakam. Thank you to everybody who tuned in and thank you to everybody who joined here in the Zoom call. Thank you, Dira. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Namaste.